um, on an effective spin half um, hexagonal uh, antiferromagnet, uh, which shows a conventional three top lattice uh, nil order with brack peaks and well defined uh, spin rates of low energies that are perfectly described by uh, linear spinner theory. However, a number of anomalous features appear in the intermediate uh, and high energy dynamics, which uh, cannot be described by uh, current approaches based on uh, spin rate descriptions, even including uh, nonlinear effects and so on in a so called nonlinear spin rate theory. So um, I'll describe how we uh, experimentally uh, characterize and quantify these departures from uh, linear spin rate behavior uh, and uh, discuss also possible. Uh, ideas that have been put forward uh, to explain uh, these very strong effects uh, that happen uh, at high energies, large transfer spectral weights from the magnons into the continuum, very highly structured continuum, and at the same time, very strongly renormalized uh, magnon dispersions with various soft modes and so on. So before I start, let me advertise uh, an upcoming uh, symposium on quantum materials in Oxford uh, this September. Uh, please consider um, attending. So um, <clears throat> this work um, has been part of the PhD project of David Pantugal, uh, who graduated from, uh, from my group uh, <clears throat> recently. Uh, the crystal, single crystals used for this work were grown by Prabhakar in Oxford using uh, an image furnace um, and uh, uh, other uh, graduate students that have participated over the years. Uh, Alan Bitten and uh, Stephanie Williams uh, also did very important work. Uh, and uh, we did uh, neutron scattering experiments uh, using the uh, LET spectrometer uh, at the ISIS neutron source, uh, together with uh, Robert Bewley and uh, uh, David Bonishan. Um, and uh, uh, we are grateful to our funders. So, um, <clears throat> as an introduction, uh, I'm uh, going to briefly mention. Uh, current outstanding issues in understanding the physics of the triangular Heisenberg uh, antiferromagnet. Uh, we've uh, heard uh, earlier on uh, through uh, the talk of uh, He Young, uh, very nice motivation about uh, exploring uh, frustrated geometries in search of for novel cooperative physics uh, and dynamics. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to highlight some open uh, questions about the uh, specific the triangular uh, Heisenberg antiferromagnet. And then I'm going to show a neutron scattering experiment on a cobalt based system, um, <clears throat> uh, barium cobalt uh, antimony, uh, which is so far one of the best realizations of a near Heisenberg uh, effective spinner half uh, antiferromagnet. And um, I'm going to uh, show how we measure the uh, excitation spectrum, uh, focus on the magnon dispersions and their strong renormalization. And one issue that uh, is important for the triangular lattice, which is not there, for example, for the square lattice, uh, is the issue whether magnons are expected to be well-defined quasi-particles throughout the Brillouin zone uh, or just uh, very close to the ordering wave vector. Um, and there are a number of theoretical predictions that uh, because of the 120 degree order, um, one expects to have uh, extensive regions with magnon decay. Uh, however, we don't see that experimentally, so uh, I'll explain uh, a possible explanation why uh, we don't see that. And then I'm going to focus on this uh, very strong and uh, strongly featured uh, as well uh, continuum at higher energies. So um, the triangle like this, uh, as Hei Young uh, indicated, was the first model uh, predicted to potentially uh, realize uh, ground states that have no long range magnetic order. That's how uh, the RVB proposal came about. Um, however, uh, it's been realized that uh, for the nearest neighbor, uh, triangular Heisenberg antiferromagnet, uh, there is long range magnetic order uh, in the three sub lattice uh, structure where spins rotate by uh, 120 degrees uh, between the uh, consecutive sites uh, on the lattice. Uh, zero point fluctuations are manifest in the ground state uh, through a spin reduction uh, from the full moment of 0.5 uh, down to 0.3. So, um, in order to understand the um, excitation, 
uh, let's first uh, establish that uh, this 120 degree order can be described as a single propagation vector, uh, which is, sits at the uh, corner point, the K point uh, of the Brillouin point. Now, um, because of the three sub lattice picture, we expect to have three well defined spin waves, um, but it's a, a much more intuitive to think in terms of uh, yeah. working in a rotating frame that follows the spin rotation from side to side. Um, so, in this uh, rotating frame, the z axis is always aligned uh, along the order spin direction. So, um, the ground state will be uh, a ferromagnet. Um, it, the primitive cell uh, is the same as for the, uh, as the one side, uh, the same as for the original uh, structural cell. Um, and then all we've got to do is, uh, so by doing this transformation, uh, we of course end up with a different Hamiltonian, uh, which breaks the symmetry between the z-axis and the uh, xy plane, which we did have before. And we have finely coupling terms like SSSX and so on. However, uh, if we solve the uh, spinner Hamiltonian in this rotating frame, we just have a single mode. And I just want to focus here on some key features of the dispersion. So uh, starting at the gamma point, uh, there's a gapless uh, uh, point here. And then we have a large lobe. Uh, we go to the K point, that's the corner of the brilliant zone. And then if we continue going uh, further down, then we have a smaller lobe. Uh, and this and this for the K point is this one up here, which is of course equivalent to that one. So um, the fact that we have uh, a large lobe and small lobe has actually very important consequences on the uh, magnon stability. So um, <clears throat> consider that. So first of all, uh, because we have coupling between SZ and SX, now uh, in a whole time chemical uh, description, uh, SX creates single magnon processes, uh, and SZ contains uh, two magnon processes. So uh, we can have uh, coupling between one and uh, two magnon processes. So, uh, and these can be created uh, via neutron scattering, and if uh, the right kinematic condition is satisfied such that we conserve uh, energy and momentum, we can have situations where a magnon decays into two other magnons. So um, let's consider that we create one magnon at minus k and the other magnon at plus k. So there's no net momentum transfer uh, and there's no net energy transfer. So the two magnon process would sit at the gamma point. Now imagine that you keep the first magnon fixed at minus k but you take the second magnon on the smaller lobe. Then uh, the two magnon process uh, will occur in reciprocal space along this dash line up here. It's simply this lobe translated down. And now if you uh, vary the position of the first magnon array, array from this point, so move it along this dispersion and position of the second magnon, then you imagine that you can see a continuum and in fact, uh, this gray shaded area above all of these small lobes illustrates the phase space for two magnon processes, uh, which satisfy the uh, conservation of momentum uh, and energy. So the important point to realize here is that the solid line, which is the dispersion of the single magnon, sits uh, in this picture entirely inside the continuum uh, of two magnons. So, um, Decay processes are allowed cinema kinematically, and they're also um, allowed by the symmetry of the Hamiltonian because we've got through this SZSX term, we've got direct coupling between longitudinal and transverse fluctuations. In the original problem, uh, if the spin fluctuates here, it couples with the longitudinal fluctuations on the other side. So that's the same illustration of this process down here. So, so we expect to have. Uh, all of these high energy magnons really decay uh, into uh, two magnon processes. Now, this is in the uh, rotating frame um, where we see a single magnon uh, and we expect this two magnons to be. Question. Yes. What implications does this have for the nature of the long range? 
in some sense, if you don't have well defined full scale modes, so ah, so, so very to close to the practice in the long wavelength limit, you must have. Um, but um, far away from uh, the long wavelength limit, there's no symmetry consideration that it doesn't prevent decay. But unless those velocities are the same at the different points, you will then inevitably even have the continuum coming below the magnon, even at the gamma point, as all, for all values vanish, right? But I think the point is that matrix elements should vanish in a space space or to decay to a throw, matrix elements should be fine. You would rather say that if it's both the mode, you, it cannot decay. So okay. therefore, we guarantee that for the infrared elements, the ones which are both the mode, matrix elements will both be zero, so long and short the will be yeah. So I'll, I'll show you in one of the next slides. Okay. So uh, there is some light time that one can associate with this decay and okay. calculate it in some nonlinear screener picture. And indeed, as, as Eugene indicated, that lifetime. Uh, goes to infinity, or the peak becomes infinitely narrow if you go get close enough to. And, and should uh, you practice. also have the emergence of a third gold stone mode due to the fact that it is now a biaxial system? Ah, so um, so okay. So this is in the rotating frame yes. where we have a single mode. Now to go back to the laboratory frame where we actually do the experiment. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to unwind this rotation of four. You'll see the three modes. Then you will see the three modes. That's okay. right. So the fluctuations that are perpendicular uh, to the plane uh, of this diagram don't participate in the rotation of coordinates. So we will see this image in the fluctuations uh, along the z-axis. However, the x and y coordinates rotate with this wave vector q. So we will see an image of this shifted by plus q and minus q, and that would be in the in-plane SXX and XY vector. So we expect to see three magnons, omega k and omega k plus minus q. These are the three modes. Can I ask a question? I remember some some old paper. I think Chubukov was involved in that on this uh, triangle that this Eisenberg model. If, if you Made fluctuations very strong, and in particular, if you go beyond linear spin wave theory, uh, you find that fluctuations tend to stabilize or favor the linear ground state. So, um, so you could then get some some ferrimagnetic state where you still have this three sub lattice structure, but some upper tau, and you would see a ferromagnetic component, I guess. Uh, yes, yes. So, so in an applied field, uh, you can sort of resurrect that phase if you like so it's it's in an applied field you do see a one-third plateau which corresponds to the up up down state and that has enhanced stability i'll come to that but you can't find it without um no, as far as i know for the nearest neighbor heisenberg antiferromagnet it's very well established by many numerical techniques that the system orders in a three sub lattice 120 degrees there's some variation between different models as to exactly what the spin reduction is, but you know, series expansions and all sorts of other methods, even exact dialysations, I think agree that it orders in, in this pattern. If for this stage, if you calculated the spin waves, uh, you wouldn't see any, any continuum. Right? Well, uh, you would see uh, two magnon uh, excitations. Um, <clears throat> Which appear in the fluctuations uh, along the spin direction, which would be in plane polarized in the laboratory frame. So you do get, um, even including, even not including magnon interactions, you do get a two magnon continuum. I mean, that is characteristic for. Uh, any system except the ferromagnet, the Heisenberg ferromagnet. Um, any system where the ground state is not an exact eigenstate of the Hamiltonian will have some zero point fluctuations. And via the sum rule, it means that the loss in intensity from the Bragg peak has to be recovered somewhere else. Uh, and for spin a half, uh, you have uh, separate sum rules for each of the three components, SXX, SYY, SZ, 
should be a third of S times S plus one. So the longitudinal scattering that you miss from the Bragg peak must be somewhere else, and it will be in the two magnon channel. So for the square lattice, we expect two magnon channel. Uh, and in that case, the natural interpretation is that you create uh, a spin wave with delta as a minus one on sub lattice A and delta as a plus one on sub lattice B. So it's an SZ zero process. That's why it's longitudinal. Okay. So, um, so, right, so in the laboratory frame, we expect uh, three versions of this uh, with the satellite sort of uh, shifted by plus minus two. So, uh, in this shaded region here, this is where uh, spin wave theory plus one over S direction. Uh, predict that one would have a uh, magnon decay. And uh, this graph here illustrates uh, sort of the, the width of the, uh, of the spin wave. So notice that it goes to, uh, it goes to it's the, the width of uh, maybe very hard to see, but some gray shading here goes to zero, shows the K point, gal point, but it's actually quite large, uh, close to the zone boundary. Yeah. So uh, this is my big law, the dashed line. And the dotted line out here is the threshold of the two magnon continuum. So, um, <clears throat> uh, in this color picture here, uh, the, this decay is illustrated by the fact. Can we maybe take this down to create more contrast? Um, I don't know. Can you actually see this color picture? Yeah. <laughs> Is that better? Okay, maybe stop here. I think it's probably yeah. fine now. Uh, can't stop it. Oh. <laughs> it's either fully up or fully down. There's no pause. Yeah. Fine. Is that okay? Is, is it better? Yeah, we're going to have a nice afternoon now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we can go back to, but I mean, my feeling was that it was, it was very hard to see the details here. Much better now. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so one of the key predictions um, is that uh, the the one magnon overlaps with the two magnon scattering and uh, appears very diffuse, uh, very broad. Uh, there are the predictions uh, that you know were first highlighted by series expansions uh, and and so on, um, which suggests that instead of having um, the, the small lobe uh, at the end point here, you actually have uh, a dip. Um, so so there, there's a dip here uh, at the end point. Um, and this is called, uh, in some language, a roton minimum. So this is on the zone boundary, and there's a softening uh, at this point. And um, that's, that is captured. Uh, it was predicted by Sirius expansion, but also captured uh, by nonlinear uh, spin rate theory. But one of the key predictions here is that you should see uh, regions of magnon decay close to the top of the uh, magnon uh, bandwidth. Okay. So uh, there are three spin wave modes, but they trade intensity against each other. And fundamentally, at any wavelength, there are only two of them will have intensity. Uh, that's why uh, you see two modes or almost everywhere. Uh, it's very hard to see three just because they trade intensity between them. Um, now, um, <clears throat> there have been, however, also alternative uh, uh, theories put forward, um, and this comes from some uh, DMRG studies uh, very close to Heisenberg limit, um, and the pr prediction of this theory is that, uh, in principle, generically, you can have two scenarios where you have uh, uh, a sharp mode that normally wants to overlap uh, with a continuum and couples to it. Uh, one possibility, a uh, so-called weak coupling, is that, uh, so in this case, uh, uh, the, the mode is flat and the continuum uh, has a boundary line. So for weak coupling, the mode goes in but decays straight away, so it appears very broad. Uh, in the second situation, where the coupling is very, very strong, the mode never enters the continuum, is repelled underneath, uh, but transfers large of its, a large part of its spectral weight to the continuum. 
And uh, um, so this was some toy model to illustrate the generic situation, but calculations were done for very for strips that mimic the two dimensional uh, triangular lattice, uh, very close to the Heisenberg limit. They can't do exactly the Heisenberg limit, that's not stable, but they introduced some small isotropy to open a small uh, gap to make it stable. And the prediction is that uh, this should have been uh, the linear spin wave order, the dispersion that would want to enter the continuum starting from this dashed line. So the, one would expect a strong overlap. However, what they find numerically is that the mode remains sharp and it's pushed underneath the continuum. Um, and there's uh, other approaches based on variation of Monte Carlo, which also suggests that uh, uh, the mode remains sharp and there's no magnum decay. That's a specific feature for, uh, for spin and a half where the interactions are very strong. So um, now uh, just to put the triangular lattice in context, so imagine a phase diagram where one starts from uh, decouple one D chain uh, and then couples them in some zigzag arrangement with this coupling J prime and gradually increases that coupling uh, reaches to reach uh, all the way up to the isotropic triangular. Now in the 1D limit, the physics is well established both theoretically and experimentally. Uh, flipping a spin creates uh, two spin-ons. Uh, the physics here is after the looking the liquid and the spin-ons can be thought of as defect spin halves that uh, separate regions that locally are nil order. And experimentally uh, by doing a, a neutron scattering process, that's a spin one process. So you create two spin half spin-ons uh, in a triplet and that's been experienced as a continuum. And that's illustrated, for example, in this particular material here. Now, uh, increasing the coupling between the chain, uh, there's uh, one material that realizes this as a third coupling. Um, what the experiment showed was that there's very strong continuum scattering uh, remaining. Um, and there was a, a theoretical approach starting perturbatively from 1D chain uh, to uh, <clears throat> suggest that uh, spin ons still remain um, as, as good eigenstates because the coupling between the chains is essentially uh, is very strongly frustrated. And so uh, the interpretation of this continuum uh, seen experimentally um, is that of uh, essentially 1D spin ons that still survive for strongly coupled uh, chains. Now, the theoretical understanding uh, is is less straightforward. Uh, one if one goes very strongly uh, towards this uh, isotropic uh, triangular lattice limit, where the, uh, there are some of the intermediate phases here, uh, and so on. So um, the material that I'm going to uh, describe today uh, is hexagonal bearing cobalt antimony oxide. So here the magnitudes comes from uh, cobalt ions two plus, um, and they are in um, uh, oxygen six uh, octahedra, and uh, they the strong super exchange uh, mediated by two oxygens uh, like this. So imagine egg sharing, and then you offset um, the the two uh, octahedra such that you have cobalt oxygen oxygen cobalt uh, exchange. So uh, this is hexagonal lattice with four uh, threefold symmetry. So the exchanges along all the uh, six bonds uh, are the same. And um, uh, early measurements already showed uh, that uh, this satisfied several key predictions um, for the triangular lattice antiferromagnet, in particular, the occurrence of a magnetization plateau. Um, because of the squashing between the layers, uh, I'll explain that the small trigonal distortion, which then creates a, a small XAZ anisotropy of order 5%. So that confines the moments in the plane. And what experiments have shown is that if the field is applied in the plane, then there is a magnetization plateau for it, uh, which occurs at a third of the saturation magnetization. If you look very carefully, uh, the experimental data is not a truly a plateau, but there's some slope. Uh, but this is understood because uh, once you put the magnetic field in the plane, there's no longer spin conservation. And one does expect to have um, <clears throat> um, a weak slope uh, for this uh, magnetization. Uh, for this one one, the up up down state. Okay. So uh, semi classically, uh, the up up down state is stabilized by zero point quantum fluctuation because uh, here 
both transverse directions can fluctuate and gain energy from, from zero point fluctuations, whereas uh, other non collinear states, such as the cone, which is degenerate with the uh, up up down uh, at, the, at the particular field of surface fluctuation, uh, this doesn't have the same zero point uh, energy gain. So, um, and this plateau occurs for fields in the plane, but doesn't occur for fields out of plane because there the uh, anisotropy uh, is sufficient to, dis to, to, to kill this uh, uh, zero point quantity. But already from here, uh, because the saturation field occurs at very similar values for the field, and also the magnetization uh, is very similar, uh, indicates that the system has uh, an almost isotropic G factor and very close to high energy. So uh, a little bit about the uh, crystal field levels. So we start with cobalt 2 plus 3D7, which is the Kramer's ion, and at the single ion level, this is L equals to 3, spin 3 half, as I discussed for another cobalt system yesterday. So uh, when this is put inside an uh, oxygen 6 uh, cubic octahedron, then we got a splitting of the sevenfold orbital degeneracy uh, into a lower triplet and other excited states. And then uh, introducing spin orbit coupling, this creates a J effective uh, quantum uh, angular momentum, uh, L plus S, and the lowest one is, is a doublet, um, uh, J effective a half, and then we have three halves and five halves and so forth. Now, um, of course, because here we have a stacking of layers, we don't have full uh, cubic symmetry at each cobalt site. We have only three bar M uh, reduction. Uh, Symmetry, so Z actually is different, there's a trigonal distortion, and that leads to some splitting here. But experimentally, uh, we can measure this directly, and uh, you can see the splitting is absolutely tiny. Okay, so it's of order uh, two, three mil electron volts on an energy gap uh, of about 40 mil electron volts. So this also uh, is consistent with the picture that the trigonal distortion is very small, the system is almost close to cubic. Um, another prediction of this uh, picture is that uh, you can't have neutron scattering transitions from a half to five halves because uh, that would mean changing their effective by two. And indeed, we've looked uh, at transitions higher up here and we can't see them. And in other cobalt systems that are uh, uniactually distorted uh, very far away from, uh, from cubic, then you mix all the Kramer sublets together and uh, we see all of the five transitions uh, between the six experiments. Up. So uh, this really is very strong evidence in our view uh, that it's very close to cubic. Also the spin orbit cutting energy that we find from here matches exactly what's seen for uh, other cobalt two plus systems uh, uh, that have been measured. So um, uh, just to emphasize this point with the uh, G factor and isotropy. So in the cubic limit, uh, the, the wave function uh, can be solved exactly, and one can show that uh, the G factor is four and a third. That's an exact result. Now, if we uh, if we uniaxially elongate, so we go towards the Ising limit, then one the the uniaxial G factor increases very strongly, uh, and the uh, in-plane one is suppressed. So you know some Ising systems are found uh, in this region up here. Uh, yesterday, I showed experiment on on a strongly uh, compressed uh, cobalt system, which was in the XY limit here, um, barium cobalt antimony sits really close to the hypertrophic point. So it's very close to having a near cubic J effective a half uh, quantum graph. And also the fact that my acquisition is two ball magnetons, um, that is really difficult to explain uh, with any other crystal field. Um, you can't, for example, say that it's spin only because that would be spin three half, a factor, G factor of two, that would be 1.5 ball magnetons. Just really impossible to get uh, four, uh, sorry, two ball magnetons uh, any other way, but very close to J effective half. So um, we're very proud of the sample for our <laughs> inelastic neutron scattering experiment. These are two core line six uh, single crystals grown in uh, image furnace. And uh, so to make up a large sample of four grams, 
because neutron scattering is signal limited. So, you know, we really want to boost the number of scattering centers. And uh, there are four lines on individual goniometers. Uh, and every single path here is through conductance, through oxygen free poppers, and these are goniometers to get the alignment you know, exactly right. Um, so, uh, the way we done the experiment, we uh, aligned the uh, hexagonal plane in the horizontal scattering plane uh, of the instrument, such that by rotating the sample, we then get many, many Brunan zones and can see the full uh, symmetry of the path. So you can see here uh, the hexagonal brilliant zones, uh, and these are the K points, and these are just some, some constant energy uh, where uh, we reveal the uh, cutting through the dispersion cell. So, uh, and um, also through vertical scattering, uh, we can probe the dispersion uh, along the uh, direction perpendicular to the, to the layers, uh, as the system it has 3D constraints. Uh, and we do that because the, the detectors, you know, have a very wide coverage vertically. Uh, here is about four meters, so we get a scattering plus minus twenty degrees also. So we can get very quantitative, full three-dimensional coverage uh, of the excitation in many directions. So uh, here is an overview uh, going along uh, a direction um, that cuts through the location of two magnetic gravity. So the key features that we see experimentally uh, are sharp modes uh, uh, of low energy, and there's two of them, uh, you know, one that becomes gapless and one that's uh, gapped. Uh, and as I mentioned before, in principle, one expects three modes, but always uh, these trade intensity between one another and only two are between. This is perfectly understood just based on square transforms of uh, exchange couplings. This is angular, so that's no mystery. So, you know, the gapless mode is associated with fluctuation uh, in the EV plane and the gap one with fluctuation out of plane. Okay. Um, now, if we want to look at uh, this uh, rotor minimum uh, at the end point, at the end point, uh, if I do a constant energy scan up here, then, uh, you know, this reveals these rugby balls uh, around the end point, very clearly seen here. So, uh, and if we zoom in, um, what's interesting is that the low magnon has a, has a, a, a deep minimum here, a soft mode, but also the top one uh, has a deep minimum. But it remains sharp uh, and it doesn't uh, decay into the continuum. In fact, there's a separation between the top magnon and the continuum. So um, now uh, this top mode actually comes from another point in the Brunan zone offsetting. Uh, by way of uh, Q. So to get it at the end point, it really comes from K by C. So I'm going to refer to these two soft modes as the soft mode at M and the soft mode at K by C. So uh, one aspect that was already highlighted uh, in previous experiments is that um, knowing the saturation field, knowing where the plat magnetization plateau occurs, um, there are several constraints that one can put on the Hamiltonian. And then one can uh, overplot the linear spin wave dispersions on top of the measured spectrum. And then one can also do nonlinear spin waves and apply it, overplot the dispersions on the measured spectrum. And one conclusion that was already apparent was that if you can describe quantitatively with a Hamiltonian which uh, explains the saturation field so that fixes the absolute magnitude of J. Uh, you can explain the, the slope of the spin wave dispersions of low energy. However, uh, the magnon zone boundary is actually way lower than where you expect it to be. So it's calculated to be, you know, over two and a half mil electron volts, but the highest energy where magnons are seen is at 1.6. And even going to nonlinear spin wave theory and doing really quite sophisticated summations and so on, that really doesn't solve the problem. This is a fundamental issue in this material that you start off with uh, linearly propagate, I mean, uh, omega proportional to k, so velocity is fixed, but the zone boundary actually is much lower than what's predicted if you were to continue going uh, with the same velocity. 
Um, there here is some more illustration to say that the hump is no reason to doubt uh, the validity of the Hamiltonian. Here are measurements on the plateau. And here are the, our experimental measurements of the three screen wave modes in that case. Uh, and uh, here is the theoretical modeling. And uh, the extent of the plateau, the field dependence of the gaps, the dispersions are quantitatively accounted for by a Hamiltonian that also reproduces the saturation field. So the natural conclusion from this is that um, the plateau and the plateau phase, because it's collinear, some of quantum fluctuations are actually much smaller and they can be uh, treated uh, in a much more controllable way. However, at zero field within the same Hamiltonian, because the uh, ordering is non collinear, there are much stronger coupling terms, and that's why the picture breaks down. So, um, so we tried to uh, parameterize our experiment to quantify to what extent. Uh, the uh, theoretical descriptions uh, break down. So um, I'm going to explain how we parameterize the dispersion so that we can achieve a full parameterization of all the possible modulations that we see experimentally. And then what new insights we can gain after having done that. So um, the first uh, important point that came up from Series experiments or various numerical approaches and from uh, spin wave and non linear spin wave analysis is that the linear spin wave approach should work very well at low end. We expect that. However, uh, there are very strong departures between the numerical results for the dispersions at, at high energy. There's a massive renormalization and also uh, very soft modes uh, that appear, which are not predicted. Uh, at the linear spin wave. So, um, so to parameterize what we see experimentally, we start with uh, the dashed line, which corresponds to linear spin wave dispersion. So remember the big lobe and the small lobe. Now, experimentally, we see two soft modes, a soft mode uh, in the lower modes here, which is that one, and also a soft mode in the top mode, uh, which is that one. So in order to get from the dashed line to the solid line, then uh, we consider conceptually that uh, there's an intersection of uh, the normal spin wave mode with some other modes that uh, are parabolic and come from above. Of course, in principle, we should consider a continuum and so on. But just uh, conceptually, um, if we consider a simple parabolic mode like this, which intersects with the normal spin wave mode, then if we parameterize it in a two by two matrix with a coupling constant, then the two modes repel each other. And then this uh, soft mode in the top mode, it actually gets imprinted with a soft mode uh, in the bottom. So, so we get, and we do the same uh, in two paraboloids, one at the end point and one at the halfway point between K and uh, gamma and, and of course, we have to be careful with this. This is a 1D picture, but we have to be careful to fully satisfy the uh, 6 4 symmetry. But we worked out a way uh, how to do that. So, so, essentially, we start from the linear spin wave uh, dispersion, which has the right periodicity, has all the right Fourier transforms, continuity, and so on. And then we add these empirical uh, parameterization of interactions with paraboloids that imprint soft mass. This is, um, this is not a quantitative theory, but it fully justified, I believe, based on what we see experimentally. So, so our aim here is just to extract curves that go through all the experimental data points and check first that uh, we can explain all the three modes. So we can verify this uh, plus Q minus Q satellites. And then with this empirically parameterized dispersion, then answer the question, can we have two magnon decays? Is the kinematic constraint satisfied? And so on. You can't do that otherwise. I don't see anything, uh, any cyclic loss, except for the problem, except for the pushing down, right? Sorry? But there is no indication for any parabolic mode. Uh, no, 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 no. So, okay. So, what I'm saying is that um, what's been shown by numerical approaches and 
going beyond spinner theory is that there's interaction and coupling between uh, the magnons at high energies and higher energy states, continuum states. In a first approximation, this coupling is pushing down the magnon. Now, we're replacing in a first approximation all this continuum of scattering with just a single set of modes, which has a parabolic dispersion. Because in that case, if we consider the interaction between the real spin wave mode and this virtual parametrization of all the states just in a single mode, we then do get at the end a soft mode imprint on the lower mode. That's the experimental mode. It's entirely an empirical parametrization. Question. Um, yeah. So in, in your figure on the top left, you've got yes. this um, that's labeled variation. So I see that has the bit in it already. Could you say what physics is in this variational calculation? Um, so this bit here. And also the middle row that has that. Uh, yes, yes. So, um, I mean, this is a, a soft mode. Uh, and then. But, but what actually was the variation of calculation? Uh, oh, okay. I, I, I don't know in detail what the variation of calculation is doing. But the physical interpretation of the softening is that uh, this is often described as a Rothon minimum by analogy with the Rothon dispersion, which is linear and then has a dip. Um, that comes with a single mode approximation. <laughs> yes, so um, so actually, um, the the higher orders in spin theory also predict uh, that this is this is not curved. Uh, which way is it concave? It's not it's not, not curved, curved like this, but actually has a very very soft minimum. Um, but series expansion and so on predict a much deeper minimum. So now, the series expansion doesn't have a minimum. And uh, M, look at the central row, maybe the right. Yeah, but M, but M is both of them have a, have a minimum. Okay, I see. I'm just is this one here? Yeah. Um, this, this top one is there. And, and how about around the top Y one? Uh, yeah, so y is equivalent at this point. And so these, the series expansion doesn't have the minimum, whatever this variation approximation is. Yeah, I, I can't um, fully explain what the subtleties of these various numerical approaches. Um, yes, but this is in the data. I mean, it's clear. It's right there in front of you. It's not as deep as this one, but it's there. It's undeniable. Um, okay. Yes. So, um, why is it? Why is there a gap? That if you look at the Goldstone minima at K one prime and K two prime, yes. you also see a red region above of around point seven. What's, what's the interpretation of that? Sorry. Yeah. Oh, so, so there's one mode that goes yeah. down, and there's one that seems to come across. That's right. right. So that so this mode that goes down. Yes, this is associated with all the spins together, just moving around. Yes, mm -hmm. so you you rotate in the plane. Mm -hmm. um, this guy up here is gap. This corresponds to flipping out the plane, but there's a five percent in isotropy that keeps the spins in the plane. Just to create some energy. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. But although it's a cal calculational trick, let's say, uh, or toy toy version, it could be real and it could be a two mark long. Uh, spin total zero bound state, for example, right? They would not be directly visible in, in, in the less than neutron scattering. Now, I'm not going to claim anything beyond the fact that we've invented a tool to convert, to parametrize the linear spin wave dispersion into a form that we can compare to the data. And then we can that satisfy all the periodicity expected. Uh, there's no artifact, all the derivatives are continuous and so on. We just found a way to do it mathematically. Um, I'm sure there are others. This is one that we found. But ultimately, the end result of this will be a solid line like this that goes through all the experiments there. And I'm going to show that this is possible. Then the question is, what does that mean? 
but we put it in a format that now any theorist can compare their favorite calculation to this to the experiment. You know, it's a way of unpicking the experiment, doing all of these three more than packing and just stating the essential result that needs to be explained. I'm not claiming anything beyond that. And how many parameters do you need? Ah, so, <laughs> uh, I mean, you're going to have quite a few parameters because, you know, the strength of this coupling is one parameter, where this sits before uh, the the interaction and so on. So there's quite a few parameters, but um, the, the physical meaning is not the number of these parameters, but it's the final result. So how, how unique is the uh, parameter? So, so I think the final dispersion is unique. Okay, so there's no other. But there could be you know, multiple combinations of getting exactly the same softening here where this is a bit deeper but the coupling uh, is weaker and all of this business okay i'm not that is all the these parameters are strongly coupled so the description in terms of these parabolas um you know there's, there's a range of parameters that could give you the same final dispersion but uh, the significance we draw from this is the final result of, of the modulated dispersion that's all we want to do there's no particular significance in, in doing this with a paraboloid or inventing some way of <laughs> adding terms to the screen wave uh, dispersion um, without, without doing the nonlinear stuff, but in a simple way that can be compared. You, you mentioned that um, Frank Bowman and um, Ruben, I think, in some of this, yes, said that the magnet don't be could you recall what the calculation was? So there, um, so some sort of time dependent DMRG. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So this is DMRG on a strip of several chains that mimics. So they have, uh, they have certain boundary conditions uh, set up such that, you know, they can mimic a set of wave vectors that are continuous along one direction and discrete along another. And, and they explicitly simulate the real time dynamics. Yes, and then from there, they extract uh, S of Q and Omega. Um, and uh, so, you know, that calculation is, you may argue, the best numerical calculation for a strip. Um, however, they can't do it exactly at the Heisenberg point. They have to add some small MSF. Like a few percent for some localizing to make it fit. But they've done various tests, as far as I understand, that's, <laughs> I don't want to put the words in their mouth, that uh, the physics would be robust even if one was to go through the Heisenberg. You would still have repelling of them. It's some way that the separation scales with this, and I sort of thought you can give some confidence that extrapolated, it would still not be, but that's not established. But the physical picture is um, you have a nominal sharp mode intersects the continua. Does it go in and decay, or does it get repelled and uh, and not decay? And we could solve this experiment. Then you know it's for a theorist to explain why. But um, our aim here was to provide robust empirical evidence that there's no decay. And understand that in a self consistent way. Yes. It's hypothetical, but what state would form if that proton actually condensed into zero? Ah, so um, that's a very interesting question. So if we add J2, yeah. um, this mode goes down deeper and deeper. Yes. And the transition between the 110 degree structure and some structure that stabilizes strong J2. Uh, is driven by this gap flow. I see. And, um, you know, the current understanding is that, of course, this is a, so you have a, a first order transition between this 120 degree structure and the phase with brackets at end points, mm -hmm. which would correspond to some strike rate. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's at the linear similar border you get that. Mm -hmm. um, however, the various uh, you know, numerical approaches actually suggest that uh, this transition is in fact uh, a region of potentially spin liquid. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't appear at, I think the classical transition is like 8% or so, but um, no, 0 0.125, I think, so it's 0.5%. But uh, as far as I remember, the, the numerical calculation suggests that the transition happens much earlier and it's potentially it was spin liquid. I'm going to come back to that a bit later. But there could be more physics uh, indeed uh, <clears throat> associated with that point. So, can I move on? Are there any other questions? Right. So, so that's what we do. We start with a dispersion that's entirely motivated empirically, but which fully satisfies all the symmetry. So, we're not introducing any artifacts, but we have enough flexibility to modulate everything that we've seen experimentally. We introduce parameters to explain certain features that we see experimentally. We introduce the minimal number to explain these features. So we see soft modes here and there. We find a way to parameterize these soft modes. Right? So, so, um, so we start with a linear spin result for uh, an XXD model with nearest neighbor in plane. We also add coupling between the layers. Um, and then we enforce the constraint that we uh, reproduce the saturation uh, critical field. Um, and then, you know, parameterize this with data. We've also tried next year neighbor coupling, but doesn't really make a difference. And the values that come out here uh, are very similar to what's been used in all the previous parameterizations. You know, within a few percent, we're all there. So, you know, the gap uh, in the spin rate uh, approach that fixes uh, this delta, uh, which means that. Which the interpretation here is that the uh, departure from Heisenberg is about 5%. Um, and uh, these values, uh, this is given essentially by the saturation field, uh, and this uh, interlayer coupling is given by the uh, interlayer dispersion. So, um, <clears throat> and this set of parameters is essentially what's been used by many other groups and that fits the plateau phase and so on. So, uh, but in addition, we can parameterize the soft mode. So uh, this is a linear spin rate dispersion plotted now as a surface plot uh, in the Brule angle. So, uh, so we start off with a gamma point uh, with circular uh, constant energy controls, which is the maximum, and then comes back down uh, at the K point. And here you have a, a trigonal uh, spin rate. This is looking from above. So circular controls around gamma and then triangular controls around K. Now the parameterized dispersion is down here. Okay. So you know it, it has the same periodicity, symmetries, and so on, but it has many more features. So first of all, the top is largely suppressed. It almost looks like a plateau here, but has the soft modes uh, between uh, uh, k between gamma and k at these k k by two points. These sort of sort of peak minima, and then there are also these soft modes the m. Uh, these wiggles down here, uh, illustrated by these uh, oval rugby balls. This is entirely an empirical parameter. But I want to convince you that this fits the data essentially perfect. So uh, <clears throat> here is some path uh, that goes in reciprocal space with two brackets. Um, and you know, we can parameterize the low soft mode, the soft, higher soft mode, uh, even uh, manifestations of this. Is, uh, out here, then um, if we go uh, at some other L position, you know, there's different modulation of these soft modes that are really well parameterized. Uh, the interlayer dispersion is captured very well. So, so we believe this is a parameterization that is a help, sort of faithful representation of what the magnetic dispersion actually is. So, um, yeah, this is just to illustrate. Uh, so here are some constant energy controls that uh, go through this uh, lower soft mode here. Uh, this is the data, very clear rugby ball. This is the model. They really look very, very good. Uh, even you know the circle around the gamma point is even there in the data. Is pretty much weak. And you know these even these ovals up here, uh, they're still in the data. I mean, really, this is a very good uh, parameter. 
So um, <clears throat> now we can look also uh, having this parametrization, we can compare um, the uh, spectrum uh, as a function of energy uh, and uh, consider uh, two magnons. So as I already mentioned, uh, one can expect to have two magnons uh, already uh, at linear order in symmetry. Okay. So, so for that calculation, now you know the positions of magnons fit because we put the empirical dispersion. So, so, so by 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 construction by fitting, and uh, you know the shaded region is what would be expected in a linear spherical group. So I mean experimentally, this is massively different. So you know there's much more continuum scattering than would be expected. So even doing even without doing any empirical any quantitative uh, calculation, um, one would expect that the spin wave scattering would be dominant, and that the two magnon scattering would appear as a higher order process. So you know would have less or you know at most the same amount of scattering. Um, and in fact, you know, doing nonlinear spinner calculations, in particular the, the K point, uh, predicts about 60% intensity in the two magnon compared to the one magnon. However, what the data shows us is that there's massively more continuum scattering um, than, than in the sharp mode. The dominant scattering somehow is actually in the continuum, not here. Or another way to think about it is that. There's such a strong interaction between these excitations and whatever this is, uh, which pushes down these modes and at the same time transfers spectral weight to the continuum. So if you have just a naive uh, interaction between two quantum states, if you put a coupling, then the lower mode will go down and its weight will be transferred to the higher. Mode. These two factors come together. The renormalization and transfer of spectral weight are part of the same process. So uh, I just want to illustrate here that uh, if magnons were to decay, uh, this is very clearly seen experimentally. It's really right in your face. It's, it's, you can't miss it. So this is another context uh, where uh, there's a sharp mode that would overlap with a continuum. In this particular case, uh, it's a one-dimensional system where the continuum is made out of two solitons. Um, and uh, this sharp mode is in some sense uh, a spin wave stabilized by some XY exchange. And when it's no overlapping with the continuum, it's sharp. But when it's overlapping, uh, you know, this uh, dashed uh, line here would indicate the nominal dispersion. Uh, it's, it's expected to be strongly decaying. That's the calculation. And then in experiment, you really see this is a sharp mode and it really broadens out. So, um, so we believe that, uh, you know, we have high resolution. Experiments are very well. Uh, characterized, very quantitative, we should have been able to see this decay, but it's just not there. Uh, I mean, these are really sharp modes, incredibly sharp. Uh, look at the resolution of this. Uh, and they're really quite separated from the continuum. So uh, there's no overlap. Uh, magnons are sharp uh, everywhere. So um, <clears throat> this one, yeah, it's at the end point, but that's right. So, so these two modes are the lower top mode, the higher top mode, and this is structure in the continuum that we see higher. Mm -hmm. If I do the variational calculation you referred to before, does that get this continuum correct? Or is it a... uh, I'll show later on another calculation based on uh, another numerical tensor network and so on. I don't really know much about it, but I'll just comment on what they say and how relevant that could be to the experiment. Um, so, so as I mentioned before, if we have just the um, Heisenberg model, there's a large region of phase space one would expect to have decay. Now, this is a top magnon, and all of this region is expected to have decay. Uh, now, uh, we have some uh, easy plane and isotropy in the system, and what that does is it gaps the mode of K. So that really shrinks the region where you could have decay, but still for the parameters that uh, fit experimentally, there would still be a region uh, that's expected to have a strong decay. Yeah. Uh, but we don't see that experimentally. So what we can do with our parameterized dispersion, so we, we take our pink line here. This is the line that um, 
go through all the three dispersion modes in experimentally, the main mode and satellite. So this is the empirical parametrization. With it, we can calculate uh, the gray area, which corresponds to the two marginal continuum. Now, the two marginal continuum starts always above this, and it never goes below. So this gives us a consistency check that with this parametrized dispersion, there's no phase space for the magnons to be phased. So if somehow, originally there was phase space, they are strongly renormalized down to such a level that where they are, they just cannot be phased. That's a consistency check to explain why we don't see magnon decay because there's no phase space. So that's the only value that we attribute from this empirical parametrization is that we can make the consistency check. We don't see uh, any uh, magnon decay. So is that consistent with a phase space? Arc? Yes, it is fully consistent. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so what I want to do, uh, emphasize here is this. Uh, the evidence for spectral waves that moves from the magnons into the continuum. So uh, here uh, to the right, I'm showing a scan that uh, is a decay point going up. So that captures a large part of the one magnon spectrum and also some features. So I want to focus just on the intensity uh, that's dominated by one magnon scattering at low energies up to here. So 1.6 or so it corresponds to this crossover uh, where the one magnon stop. Now, the significance of this red line is that um, if I was to scale it to the low energy spin wave, then this red line will be right up here, suggesting that if I was to scale the intensity to fit the low energy, then all these high energy magnons are under, are overestimated. So in fact, there's much less energy in them than there should have been. And that intensity is moved up here into the continuum. So if I, if I fit my uh, intensity scale uh, to fit the, the high energy magnons, then uh, the low energy is, is uh, underestimated. So this uh, provides a, another way to look at this transfer spectral wave between one magnon and the, uh, the continuum. Also, the sort of modulations that we see in the intensity of the continuum are very different from two magnon scans. So here, you know, at some hand waving level, you can see there's a sort of a V-shaped cone of intensity like this, and then some other structure higher up here. Two magnon scattering is also expected uh, to have some, some sort of V-shape, but much higher in energy, and certainly doesn't extend beyond twice uh, the one magnon energy. However, there are features in the uh, continuous scattering that will extend well beyond that, even up to uh, five uh, maximum uh, one magnon energy. Sorry, when you calculate your two magnon continuum, are you calculating the contribution from these artificial parameters? No, 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 no. Well? This is uh, so we do linear spinner theory, mm. and then uh, we just replace the dispersion relation omega of k with the empirical one. But we keep all the structure factors, the k dependence of the structure factor, the same as previous. Because if you might expect certainly fits with the anti cross, you'd be getting some. Yeah, so we, so, so, so the, the virtual parabolic mode we only use to get the dispersion. Once we've got the dispersion, we eliminate. Yeah, I mean, uh, somehow I know I don't find it to be justified. Anyway, this is this is our best way to be as truthful as possible to the experiment. It's justified in keeping it still on the way. Okay, fair enough. So, um, okay, so Seamus is not here, so I want to show a movie <laughs> of uh, now the the scattering, um, the intensity maps of scattering going up in energy. So, so here we are. Uh, it's an energy where we're cutting just through the uh, one magnons, and you see these uh, conical spin waves coming out of the K point. And if we go to higher in energy, you see that there's this triangular kind of threefold symmetry becomes relevant. We're almost seeing the rugby ball at the end point. Uh, then we're, we're cutting through it. You see uh, a rugby ball intersection here. 
we go even higher up, then the rugby ball is really extended out and it's touching with the triangle. Going higher up, then this uh, it touches completely. Uh, even further up, then we're going towards uh, the second soft mode. We are slightly above. This is still the edge of the one magnon, these circular regions here at the top of the one magnon dispersion. Now we're getting towards the continuum. We still see uh, remnants of the one magnon through the resolution, but this is now entirely in the continuum. There's a lot of structure here, and this is the entirely continuum scattering. This is not contaminated at all. We're far away from any one magnon scattering. This is entirely in the continuum. There's a very strong uh, and well defined structure here. You see uh, three, three uh, sort of flower, a three fold flower around each K point, then going up in energy, uh, this transforms into a ring, and then uh, sort of triangles that connect to one another right up at this energy. Uh, you can see quite clearly now the, the triangular shapes are sort of much larger in magnitude than what you've seen here. Um, going up in energy, then this dominant scattering is at these endpoints up here, these bridges. Uh, Higher up, you know, this is all in the continuum scattering. It's strongly mod modulated, and uh, you know, there's various patterns of uh, circles, hexagons, triangles that come up that really satisfy the symmetry of the uh, crystal structure. And all the scattering, by the way, goes away in the paramagnetic field. So we're confident this is all magnetic. So, uh, so just to summarize before discussing some uh, um, possible theoretical interpretation, just to summarize the uh, empirical experimental results, uh, we've observed sharp magnons uh, throughout the brilliant zone. There's no decay. And phenomenologically, we attribute this uh, to strong interactions between the magnons and continuum that push the magnons down such that they don't overlap. And then we've done a consistency check that the parametrized dispersion indeed has no phase space to the magnon decay. And then we, what we've also been able to show uh, quantitatively and empirically is that there is uh, the, the top energy magnons uh, have much weaker intensity than expected uh, by uh, extrapolating the behavior from low energy. And uh, this reinforces the idea that there's some transfer of spectral. So, where is that intensity gone? So, uh, that's gone into the continuum scattering, and that's the sort of second part of this interaction uh, with the continuum. And we definitely cannot uh, quantitatively explain this. With the two magnon process. So, uh, nonlinear screener theory fails completely to explain even the top energy of the magnets, okay? uh, less than low and various features that we see experimentally. So, you know, since our, uh, our experimental results, there have been uh, a number of theoretical proposals put forward uh, to sort of try and come up with alternative explanations. Uh, you know, I'm not uh, necessarily uh, promoting any of them, but I just want to uh, discuss the context. So here is a phase diagram for the triangular lattice, but now uh, in addition to J1, one adds a J2, and uh, for the nearest neighbor coupling, uh, there's also uh, various terms, and isotropic terms that come in, which are similar to the ones that uh, Hei Young discussed uh, earlier in, in her talk with JAC and uh, JABAA and so on. Um, so, and here is the phase diagram uh, as much of all of these parameters. So, so in this uh, horizontal plane, uh, so, so first of all, the J1 pure model Heisenberg sits at the uh, center of this diagram right up here uh, in, in the middle of the 123 order space. Now, if we go along this line in J2, then this is suppressed at sort of 6% uh, J2 or so. And there's a region here, which is basically at the meeting point of uh, several phases, 120 degree order and various stripe orders, uh, stabilized by various anisotropies. Uh, and at this meeting point, uh, it's believed to be a spin liquid phase. And there's the various anisotropies that go higher up, up here in, this, uh, in the phase diagram uh, in the plane of the phase. And various theoretical approaches agree that indeed there should be some spin liquid phase. Uh, in this region, that's a very high, high degenerate classical point where many phases meet. In some sense, you know, the uh, many different phases meet also uh, if you start off with the Kitai model and go in different directions. So it's a, it's a sort of place where 
uh, very high degeneracy, many different types of classical states become degenerate. And so uh, this higher degeneracy uh, is, is resolved by stabilizing this thing. So from hand waving level, uh, this is one way to think about uh, why white spin liquids are stabilized uh, in this region where many classical phases uh, sort of mix. Uh, but the true nature of the spin liquid phase is you know, still much under debate. But anyway, there's agreement that somewhere in parameter space, not too far away, you know, 5% perturbation, uh, where that's large or small, you know, depends on <laughs> how you view this, but there is a spin liquid phase nearby somewhere. So uh, that's kind of stimulated some approaches uh, saying that, uh, well, you know, the proximity to the spin liquid phase maybe actually does influence the dynamics in this order space. So even though it's ordered here, it remembers that uh, it can originate uh, from the spin liquid. And somehow, um, you know, maybe the, the dynamics uh, shows, show some vestiges of this proximity. Uh, so, um, in this approach here, uh, proposed by uh, Christian Batista, uh, so he's starting with uh, a Schwinger boson description of the spin liquid phase um, and proposes that uh, condensation of spin on uh, gives rise to the 170 degree order, and then two spin on bound states would be the magnon, and then the continuum would be two free states. And uh, uh, they can do this calculation. Uh, by including realistic uh, Hamiltonians. I mean, they use essentially the Hamiltonian that uh, we, uh, we propose and, and several other people, you know, all, 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 I think all experiments just agree with the set of parameters. Uh, and they include also the 3D coupling. Um, and, you know, there's some, they include one additional parameter somehow to stabilize their uh, spin liquid phase. I'm not fully, I don't under, fully understand the details. Um, but uh, this is what they predict. So uh, this is so the the solid lines are their predictions for the for the magnon spectrum, which in that picture is a two spin on bound state. Um, and uh, you see it it reproduces several features seen experimentally. First of all, uh, it reproduces very well the top uh, of the of the spectrum. Um, and remember the nonlinear screener description would give the top of the spectrum somewhere up here and the linear one is there. So no, this is a significant effect. It's sort of 40% effect we're talking about. Uh, there are some subtle features that they don't get, uh, which is the presence of these soft modes, but they have some a way of saying that uh, maybe they introduce some interaction between uh, the spin-ons and maybe that becomes relevant at these points and so on. But um, certainly there's one, one, one mechanism alternative to uh, starting from a spinner description uh, to characterize uh, the dispersions and to explain the very large renormalization that's seen. Uh, I think that's well-established experiment. That's what I'm trying to convince you through all our very sophisticated parameterization that we really know the dispersion and the Hamiltonian is known to high confidence. So, um, of course, it would be nice to sort of extend the theory in some way that has uh, predictive power, and then we can do, uh, you know, the definitive experiments such as uh, what happens in magnetic field, you get new types of excitations and so on. And, you know, that's probably an interesting area to further explore. Now, another approach that uh, has been proposed recently is based on uh, tensor networks. Uh, I really know detailed understanding of how this works, but they, they start with some wave function and they start with a quantitative Hamiltonian. And as far as I can tell from their paper, there are no adjustable parameters. So they, they don't include the 3D coupling, but they do include the nearest neighbor and the anisotropy. And uh, this is their predicted spectrum. Um, and this is uh, the experimental data. So uh, one discrepancy is the fact that uh, they really should get things gapless, but they mentioned something about the limiting size of their tensors and so on that probably uh, introduced some cut off and so on. So they they say that that's really something that can be dealt with. But what I want to, what really you know struck me, uh, you know, imagining that I was doing an experiment and seeing this, 
is a very strong similarity at the intermediate and high energies with the one minus ten. Essentially, the top energy comes out exactly right, the middle energy comes out exactly right. Even the depth of the soft modes comes up almost nearly there. We know it after the whole And of course, they know they then they get a continuum capturing. And you know, there are features <laughs> in this continuum that are not dissimilar to the data. For example, uh, there's this U shape here with high density of states there. You know, there's something in the data with high density of states there. Uh, you know, here they predict various modes. Um, you know, in the experiment, there's diffuse capturing here and so on. You know, my view is that this is worth exploring further. And uh, whether, you know, they, they can make some specific predictions that uh, it could be uh, tested uh, in more detail experimentally, you know, to be unambiguous. I mean, they mentioned, again, there are some similarities between these two approaches in a sense that uh, the interpretation here is that some of these excited modes are associated with uh, some sort of longitudinal Higgs mode that's um, that's there because of proximity to the quantum critical point, and so uh, departures from the, as a, as you leave the quantum critical point, then uh, they, you see uh, these longitudinal fluctuations in some, some sort of damp mode. Um, okay, I don't want to speculate, but um, you know there's potentially a, a range of other numerical techniques. Uh, not starting from uh, a screen red picture that uh, you know had some hope in, uh, in being compared quantitatively uh, with these terms. I mean, our role as experimentalists is to, uh, to do the experiment properly and analysis and just set it as a challenge for the community to come up with an explanation. Right, thank you very much. That's all I want to say. Okay, maybe I should go to the uh, stick to the experiment. Right. Open okay. questions. So, um, I mean, it's really nice that they are really interesting. Um, so, there are two schematics that one can think about, at least right. within your picture, mm -hmm. because you're talking about J1, J2. Uh, we're trying to allow this uh, with a certain range of J1, J2. We can have RBV schematic that has right. been. Geometrical to the geometrical frustration. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned, in this uh, JPEG you have, you're allowed to have a Picard and Gamma interaction as well. Right. And that can also have spin liquid near the desired point. So yeah. there are uh -huh. two different types of spin liquid uh -huh. uh -huh. principle. Um, and I wonder uh, what is the, is there a way that we can kind of say which spin liquid that we are nearby? Oh, I mean, for me, even establishing that the physics is definitely due to proximity spin liquid would be a, <laughs> a major solid advance if that could be proved reliably. Um, so, I mean, if, for me, there have to be experimental consequences that you can distinguish. So, you know, if, if you can come up with saying that model A predicts this, model B predicts the peaks to be there, or as a function of field, they would move this way or that way. You know, that can be tested. So, I mean, what the experimental evidence that constrains the model uh, will have to be the magnetization curves along the two directions. The fact that there's a plateau there, uh, the range of the plateau and so on. And, um, you know, the dispersions that we see in, um, uh, in zero field. Um, one other experiment that we've done, uh, which uh, let me just briefly flash it, is um, so, um, of course, if you have just uh, Heisenberg couplings, uh, this 120 degree order can come in two versions. Uh, for a single layer, uh, you can rotate clockwise or anti clockwise. And uh, so you can call these domains if you like. Um, and uh, in zero field, uh, the dispersion relations and the dynamical correlations of these two domains are exactly the same. 
it's impossible to distinguish. So doing an experiment, it's impossible to distinguish whether all the sample is you know, one parality or the other, or whether there's an equal population of the two. Of course, uh, you would need to have Jaloshinsky Maria or some other types of interactions to really break the symmetry between them and stabilize only one of them. So, um, however, the situation becomes different if you apply a magnetic field and uh, raise the spins out to form a core. Because here you've introduced an up with a magnetic field, you have an absolute sense of up. Whereas before, up and down were the same. So with a magnetic field, the sense is unique. And then the spin waves that are on the cone that follows the sense of magnetic field are different from the spin waves on the cone that rotates in the opposite direction. And um, here um, is the expected scattering uh, in the cone phase at some field. So we have three modes. And here, um, I believe the spin wave um, is on the cone that rotates in the same sense of the field, uh, whereas the other domain, um, which has the spin wave, which, which is the cone that rotates in the opposite sense of the field, um, so minus Q, uh, so the spin, the softest and most intense spin wave is a minus K, and here is a plus K. So, so these two uh, are distinguishable. But what we saw experimentally is, is the sum of the two. So uh, this is consistent with the fact that uh, DM interaction is disallowed in the system for any in-plane coupling, nearest neighbor, next nearest neighbor, any in-plane type scattering is symmetry disallowed, is also disallowed for the straight eclipse scattering vertically, sorry, eclipse uh, neighbors vertically. In principle, it could be symmetry allowed for going up and sideways, but we experimentally see an equal population of the two domains. So, uh, so we rule out our Mochitsky Maria coupling. So we, we simplify the problem uh, from that point of view. Yeah. That's what we've done. But um, really, I think the empirical information must be uh, the dispersion is in zero field, the fact that the 110 degree order appears quite robust, uh, the phase diagram in field, the dispersion in the plateau phase, saturation magnetization, all of this. I mean, any Hamiltonian would have to satisfy this. It will be the test. If you believe there are other experiments that haven't been done, you know, I'd be interested to hear that they could distinguish, if they could answer the question, are you close to approximate spin liquid? And then if you are, is this spin liquid A or spin liquid B? There has to be some specific prediction. And you would see these new modes that, or the polarization will be this way or not that way, or, yeah, I just wanted to say um, that it, it's interesting because what comes around goes around. There's been a 30 year gap since the early days of working on these models, and uh, the new uh, community doesn't reference the old community all that much. Um, well, sorry, uh, I mean, no, 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 it's, it's, a theor it's a theorist, not the experimentalist. Um, but the whole, the whole idea of using this twisted representation we explored a long time ago with Collier Larkin. Um, one of the points that came out of that was that the you mean the rotated frame? Yeah, yeah. The, 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 the twist axis that we're using in some sense defines uh, another axis in the plotter. Uh, and that you could, in principle, have phases in which you lose one of the biaxiality of the magnet whilst retaining, for example, the fact that the spins lie in a plane, a little bit more like a, a bit like a P wave superconductor in the sense that's having a D vector, which defines the direction perpendicular to the plane. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you have lots of spin wave fluctuations, there's a lot of directionality associated in the two magnon, the, the two magnon continuum itself defines a direction. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the possibilities that could be considered in parallel with the purely isotropic uh, spin liquid scenario. is the possibility of a kind of pneumatic phase mm -hmm. in which you have two spin order, uh, but no one spin order developing uh, mm -hmm. as an intermediate phase. Um, uh, I don't know. If, uh, so, um, I mean, am I understanding correctly that 
some key features of that phase would be that there, so there'll be a phase transition with manifestation using the back There will be no magnetic back peaks, but there will be sharp modes with the intensity going to zero as you go to the so nominal back peaks. Yeah. Yeah, that will be extremely interesting to see experiments. And it sort of fits in, it's, it's kind yeah. of it's not as dramatic as a, a two spin. Thing. No, but um, you know, it, but, uh, I'd be very happy to see that experiment. You know, this will be a sort of phase that would, would, would have a lot of many, many years yeah. ago. The Russian mm -hmm. community thought about the idea of, of math. They, they were the first committee to talk about spin mathematics. Uh, this is one of the scenarios that was kind of out there. In the, yeah, the, I, I believe the, 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 there are candidates spin pneumatic systems. Mm -hmm. But uh, as far as I can tell, um, Nowadays, this comes from thermodynamic from measurements. Yes. And there's no experiment that shows phase transition manifested in heat capacity mm -hmm. anomaly, absence of bracket peaks, and sharp modes with intensity going to zero to the bracket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there are other, there are actually other um, other models um, with also the polar order and so on. Some of this stuff might be lost. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. kind of related to my question because, yeah. uh, if I'm not mistaken, the classical, if I have um, an ideal normal model on the triangle lattice, I think near the empty pair of the tire, there is an inadequate. Oh, yes, 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 yes. yes. That's right. That's right. Um, with um, With brackets <laughs> polarized along x, y, and z along the three directions. Yes. That's, that's and uh, uh, within that model, classical again, um, the, any hundred penny um, near the you know, isotropic Heisenberg, if you add any small Kitai infraction, hundred penny become destabilized. And then you move to the G2, so called G2 phase. Yes, yes, and then vortex. And become a pneumatic uh, NP barrel Kitai uh, form. So, I mean, intuitively, I would expect that this has a large is a high angle infraction compared to others, mm -hmm. but it doesn't matter how large high angle you have, it has infraction will destabilize moving into um, other things. So in that sense- uh, Yeah, so I mean, the experimental be. situation on the system is that the practice really are at the third of that. Right, but you're nearby those- uh, We are nearby. And um, small. there are systems that have practice away from a third of the uh -huh. um, Yeah, I mean, I'd certainly be very interested to hear some more reports. Um, but there could be you know, a, a range of physics that would be interesting to explore around this um, strongly practiced point. Even, even order theory is yeah. still really yeah. interesting. Okay, I think we'll break. No, no, we can I, think I, I, I think it would be a good point yeah. to break. Okay, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. This has been great to talk. Thank you so much, Fred, for coming here. Well, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> and uh, we have spoke while well, we're running 12 minutes late, so I think we'll start 12 minutes late. Okay. Yeah, okay, so let's make it this way uh, back here at uh, 4 15. So, by the way, for uh, for following speakers, I have worked out how to get rid of the banner. Oh, so it's control.